you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9, so just a small portion. Uh, don't get your hopes up, you know, three verses means a 20-minute message. Don't get your hopes up. But uh, it's a small, small chunk. We're going to be looking at righteous lots, and that was something we talked about last week. Every time I read about righteous lot, it's shocking to me. So we want to uh, jump in and take a look at this. So uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, we'll be looking, we'll begin at verse 6. So coming into the middle of a sentence, actually, on verse 6, says, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes... He condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that through the next few moments, as, as we look into your word, as we unpack this passage, I pray that you would uh, clear our minds, take away the uh, uh, cares of, the, of, of daily life, help us to be able to focus just for a few moments on your word. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would encourage us. But ultimately, Lord, I, I pray that your word would sink deeply into our hearts and when we leave this place today, we would seek to share this truth, the, the, the good news of the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we looked at Peter's warning to the church about false teachers. That was the, the point of the message. These false teachers were seeking to pervert the gospel message. And we see that even today. We have an a, a attempt to pervert the gospel. Some more overt than others. I would say probably the, the more covert, the sneaky perversions are, are worse. The guy, you know, the, the, the Mormons who will just, you know, completely throw away orthodoxy, they're relatively easy to recognize. It's the, the people who claim orthodoxy that uh, uh, the majority of what they, they, they say they teach is in line with Scripture with just a few twists and turns. That's difficult. So Peter is warning the church to, to avoid, recognize false teachers. He assured us that God will judge the wicked. And then he tosses in this little snippet, this just little thing here about righteous lot. We breezed by it then. We just ran by it. Yeah, we, that wasn't kind of the point of the message last week. But today we're going to look at this in depth. And if you notice on, on the screen, I've got the exclamation point and the question mark. It's more righteous lot. How can that be? And if Peter didn't specifically describe lot as righteous three times in this passage, none of us would have thought him as such. You know, he's just a bad, he's just a bad guy. That's all we would get from the Genesis explanation of him. So today I want to address this passage by answering, essentially answering the four questions I ask as I'm studying through who Lot is. When we think of Lot being righteous, there are, there's four questions that come to mind, at least, at least in my mind. So that's what we're going to do, jumping in. Before we get into that, though, we do have a little bit of a background. We've got to you know, get up to speed as to who Lot is. Many of you, you know who Lot is. Okay, that's a, you know, I've, I've grown up learning about Lot, but maybe not all of us know exactly who Lot is. Uh, we meet Lot in Genesis 11. He's the nephew of Abraham. Abraham was Abram at the time. God changes his name at some point in there, but he's the nephew. In Genesis 12, he goes with Abram to the land of Canaan. So Abram, again, um, without getting too far off track, Abram is just a guy from Ur, right? He, get, he moves to Haran uh, with his, his father, He's just a guy, but God chooses this just guy. I'm going to bless the world. I'm going to use your family. Not because Abraham was special, not because Abraham had, was a superhero or super spiritual. We see from Scripture he wasn't, but God uses Abraham. God unilaterally picks Abraham. He's going to bless the world through, through Abraham's family. So Abraham moves to Canaan, and Lot, his nephew, tags along. 
there's a, there's a famine in the land, and, and Abram moves down to Egypt for a little bit, and Lot tags along. After the famine is over, Abram moves back up into the Canaan land, this land that God has promised him, and Lot tags along. He comes along with. They become so wealthy with herds and flocks that the land can't support their two households living together. And so Abraham comes to Lot and says, hey, we got to separate. Our, our herdsmen are fighting. This isn't going to work. You go left, I go right, or you go right, I go left, but we got to separate. Abraham gives Lot his choice of land. Now, Lot takes the well-watered Jordan Valley. And I've heard pastors preach that this was selfish of him or wrong of him somehow, and I don't think that's the case. Um, Abraham gives him the choice, and there doesn't seem to be a morality to it, because if, if Lot didn't choose it, Abraham would have. So it's not so much a, I don't think in this situation, Lot does something wrong, but he, ch he takes this Jordan Valley, but he ends up drifting all the way south to Sodom. Now, Sodom is Miles and miles, maybe, maybe dozens of miles south of, of the Jordan Valley. So he doesn't stay in this well-watered plain. He ends up finding his way to Sodom. In Genesis 14, Lot gets captured in an attack on Sodom. There's, there's four, four city-states that attack Sodom and their, their allies and take a bunch of people captive. And Lot is part of that because he's been living in Sodom. That's the first time we see Lot living in this city called Sodom. Abraham hears of this. He gets his household servants. He seems to have a, a little bit of a militia in his, his household servants. He's got a security team, and they get, they get armed up. They get geared up, and they go, and they rescue and overcome. They bring Lot, all the people back, and all their stuff. Now, the next time we see Lot is in Genesis 19. So we take a little bit of a break from Lot where God is interacting with Abraham. And then in Genesis 19, God's messengers, there's two angels and there's three beings. Two of them are, are messengers, are angels, but the one, he negotiates. He, he talks to Abraham with authority. It seems to be a theophany. It seems to be a, 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 a appearance of God, of, of, of the pre-incarnate Christ. But they come to talk to, to Abraham, and they say, Shall we, we're not going to keep this secret. We're destroying Sodom. And what we get in the passage is Abraham then negotiates, starts to negotiate because he knows Lot lives in Sodom. And he says, what if there's 50 righteous? You're going to destroy a city? How, how could you destroy a city for 50 and kill 50 righteous? And he goes, okay, there's 45. And, he, and Abraham works his way down to 10. God, if there's 10 righteous people, will you spare the city? Okay, so there's, there's, they negotiate down to 10. You go into the city of Sodom, if there's 10 righteous people, we won't destroy. So God's messengers, they come to the city, they, they're counting righteous people. They don't count to 10. They don't, they don't need both thumbs. Uh, they actually uh, you know, they don't, probably don't need one hand. But they're counting right, righteous people, there's not 10. And so they end up essentially pushing Lot and his family out of the city before they proceed to destroy it. The last, the last we see of Lot is at the end of Genesis 19, where his daughters, thinking everyone else in the world is dead, they, they think that this is the end of the world, and there's not going to be any more people. Because they think everyone else is dead, they end up sleeping with their father, and they have children with him. So he raises his own child-grandchild. That sounds like an old Ray Stevens song, but... Uh, uh, that, that's the last time we see Lot. So just buzzing through that very quickly kind of gets you up to speed. If, if you're not familiar with that story, after church today, break out the book of Genesis, start in 11, go through 19, and you'll, you'll be up to speed. Now, in that description, or that, 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 that background, several descriptions come to mind when we're thinking about Lot. But righteous usually isn't one of those words. So what gives? How does this all work? How does Lot get to be called righteous? Why does God call, right, God, God call Lot righteous when we wouldn't? So four questions regarding righteous Lot. We'll jump right in here. What, first question, and I think this is probably the, 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 the most important one, what does it mean to be righteous? 
Lot's righteous, but we see him doing, if not, if he's not doing bad things, and certainly at the end of his life, the end of our, our story, he does some bad things, to some extent against his will necessarily. The, the, the issue with his daughters, they get him slobbering drunk. He has no idea. The scripture actually says he doesn't know when they come in, when they leave. They get him so blackout drunk, he doesn't know what's happening. So it's not like he's actively necessarily doing this. But if not wicked, at least terrible decision-making, how can he be righteous? So the first thing we have to do is understand what does it mean to be righteous? And as we, as we go through this, I see three different kinds of righteousness, or at least, at least in quotation marks, righteousness that we need to deal with. First, there's actual righteousness, which means without sin. Now, this was lost in Eden with Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve, before the fall, could walk and talk with their creator. They could, they could essentially look God in the eye because there's no sin. There's no, there's no shame. There's nothing that, that uh, uh, makes them need to hide until they eat the piece of fruit. Then what happens? Without being told... They hide. God comes down. Hey, where are you guys at? He knows where they're at. But where are you at? Well, we were hiding. Why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? So there's actual rightness, righteousness. We've lost that. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So actual righteousness, that's, that's, that's lost to us. We don't have that. Lot isn't actually righteous. There's a comparative righteousness. This is where we compare ourselves to the people around us, usually the bad people around us. I don't like to compare myself to the good people around me because I don't measure up so good. So, you know, the guys who accomplish a lot of things and do a lot of stuff, I don't, you know, but that, that, that lazy guy down the road, yeah, I got it. So this is where we compare ourselves. This often makes us feel better about ourselves, but it isn't really useful in relationship to God. Why? Well, because God is perfect. If I compare myself to God, you know, that's in the adult Sunday school class today, we were talking about the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments do, do several things, regulate society and, and reveal God's character, but it also reveals mankind's need for salvation, need for rescue. Because if you, even the first Ten Commandments, you read down through those things, that's going to scare the daylights out of you. It should. So first Ten Commandments, of the Ten Commandments, at best you're, 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 get, you're, you're keeping two and probably zero. We're probably batting 0 for 10. Romans 3, Paul says this, beginning in verse 9, he says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it's written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So this is our, you know, we can compare ourselves to each other. But when we turn our attention to God, this is how we stack up. No one does good. So, Lot may be comparably righteous to the, to the Sodomites, but that doesn't really do us any good. And so what we come to our final idea here, and I think this is where we have to land, is positional righteousness. You might say imputed righteousness. God crediting one with righteousness through faith in God himself. God giving of his, his own righteousness or crediting righteousness. Sometimes we talk about being covered in the blood of Christ. And in our culture, you know, that, that seems like an alien thing. But um, this picture of being sprinkled or sloshed with, with sacrificial blood, the, the, the Jewish people at the time would have understood that. At the, at the temple, when the, on the day, of, uh, the day of atonement, when they would sacrifice the animals. And, and I love the, I'm not sure if the ESV uses this word, but the King James talks about sprinkled. They would sprinkle the people. And, and that sounds pleasant. That sounds nice, right? No, they would have big, big bowls <laughs> sloshing. That might be a, a better word. Uh, if you were in the front row, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're, sometimes they talk about church. If you're too close in the front, you're in the spit pit. Um, but that's, uh, I try not to. 
but if you're in the front row of this, this, uh, this, this sacrificial time, you're coming home drenched. But that's that picture of, of, of God crediting or covering us with his own righteousness. It's called, again, imputed or given righteousness. And we see this throughout Scripture. Genesis 15, verse 6 says, and he believed, and this is uh, Abraham, and Abraham, or he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Abraham wasn't even actually righteous. He was credited with righteousness for believing. And we see this repeated multiple times in the New Testament. In Romans 4, verses 3 through 5, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. James 2, the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. He wasn't a friend of God because he was somehow better or he had some supernatural mutation that he could see God and communicate with God. No, he believed God. He trusted and he was given. He was, he was uh, imputed righteousness. So Lot is clearly not righteous. He's not actually righteous. And just being better than the Sodomites isn't much of an accomplishment. Think of that. You know, if your greatest accomplishment in life is being better than the Sodomites, you know, or the, 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 the Gomorites or whatever, you know, what they're called, that's not that big of an accomplishment. So if, Ra, if Lot is righteous, his righteousness must be positional. It's imputed by God through faith. Now, this leads to our next question. How does one attain a righteous standing? How do you get this? We've, 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 we've broached it a little bit. And Paul addresses this directly uh, in his letter to the Galatians. So Galatians chapter 3, Paul says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now this was revolutionary. Many of us have read this multiple times and we just kind of, Okay, that, that's, that's what it says. But this idea that those of faith are the sons of Abraham. Remember, the, 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 the Pharisees, the Sadducees that, that Jesus interacted with, they put all their eggs in the basket of being physically related to Abraham. We're Abraham's children. God made promises to Abraham. We're biologically related to Abraham, so we're in. God is pleased with us because... We're related to Abraham. And what Jesus even says, because Jesus says, Abraham's not your father. Who does Jesus say your father is to, to these Pharisees? The devil's your father because you're liars. And he's the father of liars. So even though, yes, they're biologically related to Abraham, what Paul says in Galatians is that it's those of faith. Abraham's descendants are those who believe. Righteousness is imputed, it's accredited through faith, through trust in God for a righteous standing. Trust in God for salvation. When I stand before God, when I stand before the righteous judge, my, my eternal fate, heaven or hell, hangs on my righteous standing. Am I righteous or unrighteous? Now I know, I know myself. Just as Paul referred to himself as the chief of sinners because he's the worst sinner he knows, I'm also the worst sinner I know. So I'm going to stand before God knowing that I don't measure up. I don't actually measure up. But my faith isn't in myself. My faith is in the blood of Christ, the imputed righteousness through faith. And this is really a two-sided coin. Uh, um, 
when we talk about imputed righteousness, there's, there's two sides to the same coin. We're going to walk through this relatively quickly, but we, we want to be supremely biblical here. So a righteous standing has, has kind of a two-pronged thing. The first thing here is God's sovereignty. We see God's sovereignty in this attaining a righteous standing. In John 6, 44, Jesus is talking, and he says the Father draws people to himself. The verse says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we see, we see God's sovereignty at play. God draws people. The reason this is big is because we won't come to God on our own. We won't do it. You know, we can't because we have this sin nature, but we also won't. You may talk about people who are looking for God. There's, there's searchers around the world looking, you know, the, the spiritual pilgrims looking for God. Unless God draws them, According to Christ, they're not gonna, they're gonna look everywhere else, looking for God in all the wrong places, but they're not going to come to God on their own. God must draw them. In Romans 9, Paul affirms that God chooses to whom he will show mercy. Romans 9 says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Sometimes I think we read a verse like that, and that offends us. We don't like that. God saying, I'm going to have mercy. I will give gifts to who I want to give gifts to. That's what he's saying. And come on, God, that's not fair. What? That's not fair, God, right? That would be our thought. That would be the, 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 the first thing that comes to mind. I don't like this. It's not fair. Except who deserves God's gifts? Which one of you wants to raise your hand, be the first one to raise his hand, saying, I deserve God's gifts? I'm not doing it. <laughs> we got a roof, but I'm afraid of lightning. We don't. We don't deserve God's gifts. If God is going to show any mercy, any grace, that's more than we deserve. In Ephesians, we see that God chose before creation who he would adopt. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And then verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What you get in this verse is a picture of a sovereign God who acts out his will. A good God, a loving God, a gracious God, but a sovereign God. And we can't rob him of that. And I think in that verse, the, the, the word adoption is big. When we start talking about salvation, there's a lot of words we use. Justification, righteousness, sanctification. Sanctification is after salvation. But there, there's words that we use that deal with salvation. I think adoption is, is, a, is a beautiful and a powerful word. Because if anybody is familiar with adoption, the adopted child has no biological right to the family. I, I have some, some friends who have fostered and, and have adopted children. I know many people that have adopted children. Those children have no biological right to the family. Their inclusion is totally through the discretion of the adopting parents, through their loving kindness. I mean, sometimes you'll picture, I've known of people that have gone overseas and, and gone to an orphanage and adopted a child. But really, they would go into an orphanage and there would be 20 or 30 children. And they would pick one. Why? That's, that's, that's their business. Why'd you pick this child? And I don't know. I, I, you know it's their discretion. And I think there's a, there's a, 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 a powerfulness to that that word, because this is what God does. He adopts people into his family 
who have no business being in his family. This is why we can assert that God does choose who he will adopt. We use that word predestination. I kind of hesitate to jump into a, a deep discussion of the doctrine of predestination. But as we walk through these verses, we can assert that God does choose who he will adopt. God chooses who he will save. But we cannot assert that God doesn't choose who he will reject. There's a, there's a, a double doctrine here. There's a doctrine of predestination. Does God choose? Well, Jesus says he does. Paul says he does. God says he does, right? But one thing that God does not say is that he chooses some to condemn, Why? Why is that the case? Well, because how many of us deserve condemnation? We all do. Adam and Eve chose condemnation because they ate the piece of fruit. In them, we received their sin nature, but every single one of us shook our fist at God. Maybe we didn't eat the piece of fruit, but we've, I don't know, taken the cookie that mom said not to take. We've broken God's law. Every single one of us purposely have broken God's law. We've chosen condemnation. God in his goodness has chosen adoption. That's, that, it, it, it's an incredible doctrine here. It's an incredible thing that we see God's sovereignty, God's goodness in saving. But it doesn't end with God's sovereignty. It doesn't, it doesn't just lie with God's sovereignty. God holds man responsible. There is a responsibility on our end. Jesus says in Mark 1.15 that, that we need to repent and believe the gospel. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As you are presented with the truth, you are called, you are, you are accountable for receiving it, for believing it. John 3.16, this, this great passage that almost every Sunday school child learns, the first verse you learn, affirms that belief brings life, disbelief brings condemnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. One of the great passages on the gospel, Romans 1.16 affirms that the gospel brings salvation to all who believe. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of salvation to those who believe. We're called to believe. God holds people responsible for their acceptance or rejection of the gospel. And he commissions his people, Christians today, to be the ones who deliver that message of the gospel. We often use the word participate. He allows us to participate in presenting the gospel. Romans 10, beginning in verse 13, he says, For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. That's part of the Romans road. If you've, if you learned, if you've learned how, to, how to lead someone to Christ using the Romans road, Romans 10.13 is usually that last verse. If you call on the name of the Lord, you believe, you trust in the Lord, you will be saved. There's a surety to it. But then, then Paul goes on. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And don't think when you see the word preach, we're talking just behind a pulpit. We're talking about proclaiming the good news. That's what we're called to. Not a heavy-handed command, you better, you better evangelize or else. This is a, a privilege. Because God doesn't need us. God doesn't need us to share the gospel. He allows us to share the gospel. He encourages us to share the gospel. Yes, he commands, but we get to participate. So we see man's responsibility. We see, we see and again, I always use the term, the, the two sides of the same coin. Because if I ask you, what is on a quarter? I was going to put a picture on the, on the PowerPoint, and I didn't. But if I ask you, what, what picture is on a quarter? Well, we can, come to, we can have different answers, right? Some of you might say George Washington. 
Some of you might say an eagle or whatever is on. I know that they, they change it every once in a while now. But both those answers are right. Yes, George Washington's on a, on a, on a quarter. But yes, that other picture's on a corner. Well, why? Because it's two sides. Is God sovereign over salvation? Does God, does God draw and choose? Yes. Is man responsible for believing the gospel? Yes. Both those things are true. But this is how we achieve, how we get this righteous standing. It's through faith. It's through God's grace in, in granting that faith. And this leads to our next question. At first blush, Lot seems to lack any resemblance to a Christ follower, right? I mean, as you read through that passage, those, pa those chapters, you're not going to, at first glance, see a whole lot of Christ-likeness. So how are we supposed to know that he's a believer? Is this just a switcheroo? Is, is Peter just making stuff up? No, I don't think so. So what are some characteristics of a righteous person, of a, of a believer? Again, we, we recognize that your righteousness is not, uh, 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 we're not perfect. Lot certainly wasn't perfect. But what are some of the characteristics? Can we have some criteria to, to uh, I don't want to say assume, but can we have, is there some criteria to affirm, yeah, I think this person's in the faith. And I think there is. And as we look through even the Genesis 19 passage, we'll see some of this in, in, in Lot's life. One is to recognize and respect God's messengers. So Genesis 19.1 says, The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When, when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And as that passage goes on, they say, hey, we're going we're gonna to sleep here in the, 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 the square. We're going to sleep at the gate, the square. And Lot's like, no, 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 don't do that. You can't, no, no, that's not a good idea. You need to come to my house. There, there was a respect. Now, he, he doesn't recognize them right out the gate as angels, but at some point they do reveal that, hey, we are messengers from God. We are going to destroy this city. And he recognizes that and he respects it. There's, there's a, a recognition We see there's an attempt to be, in a God, to be a godly influence. This is interesting. This is fascinating to me because we, we've probably known men and women, and we can probably all look back in our own lives at some Christian who really did influence us. Maybe, you know, old, old Mrs. McGillicuddy who taught the third grade Sunday school class who led you to Christ, uh, or, you know, that, 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 that faithful grandfather or you know, great-grandfather who, who, who demonstrated a, a godly example. Then you have Lot. And Lot tries. He fails miserably, but he tries to have a godly influence. In verse 9 of, of Genesis 19, uh, the, 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 the men of Sodom, Sodom have, have surrounded Lot's house. They're trying to beat the door down. They just got to get to these angels. They just want these angels so bad. And, and, and uh, uh, Lot says, no, this is wrong. Stop doing this. Don't, don't, don't do this. I think he calls them brothers, though. And that, that's, that's sketchy. But he says, don't do this. And their response is this. They said, but they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we'll deal worse with you than with them. And they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break down the door. Now, what we see there in a little bit, and, and I think even at, the, at verse 1, where was Lot at? When the angels come in, he's at the city gates. That's where the leaders of the city are. That's where, that's where the, the, the official business of the, of the city is done. Now, I don't know if he's been brought into leadership or he's just trying to be where the leaders are. But he's put himself in a position to have some influence. They recognize that he's judging them or trying to be a judge. I think we do see to some extent some pathetic, pitiful extent, that Lot's trying to have an influence. He's trying to be a good influence on them, a godly influence on them. Now, this is a point that needs to be made as we, as we move forward. Yes, 
Christians do need to be willing to go out of our way to reach the lost. Right? You, could, you could argue that, that, that Lot went out of his way. He went to Sodom to reach the lost. We need to be able to be, be willing to be inconvenienced to win the lost. Certainly, that is true. We need to go, you know, be, go where the lost are. And yes, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners. Yes, those things are true. But we need to be very careful when we're going into this world's strongholds of sin. We need to be very careful. Do not be presumptuous. If you're a recovering alcoholic and you decide that, you know what, I'm going to do a Bible study in a bar because that's where all the sinners are. I would argue, did I, think deeply about that. And I've heard, some, I've heard some success stories of things like that, but I've also, there's some failures. I'm going to go where my sin temptations are to reach the other people who are in those sins. Let's be very careful. I don't want to make this hard and fast rule, you know, but clearly Lot did not have the influence he wanted. Abraham had more influence over Sodom's fate from Hebron. That's where Abraham lived. That's where the angels came and, and uh, they told him what was going to happen. He had, and that's something like 30 miles away. Lot, uh, or Abraham had more influence over Sodom's fate than Lot did within Sodom. Okay, just understand that. So I think we need to be aware there, you know, be very careful in that process. I think uh, a characteristic of a righteous person is that our hearts are grieved by wickedness. And this is, we see this in 2 Peter chapter 2. As far as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Lot doesn't seem to have ever given in to Sodom's sinfulness. His, his soul is, is grieved. The question you could ask, and I think rightfully, then why stay? Why be there? It, it, it is interesting. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the verse in 2 Peter before we talk about Lot, he talks about Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And Noah and Lot have very, some very similar, some very overlapping characteristics. They were both in a very, uh, they were both righteous. They were both in a, uh, a very godless society. They were both uh, unable to change that society. The difference is Noah couldn't leave because that was the entire world that Noah lived in. Noah had to be rescued from the entire world. Lot had to be you know, pulled out of this one city. But Lot seems to be grieved by sin. I think that's a great characteristic of a righteous person. Does wickedness grieve your soul? Sometimes you can do something about it, sometimes you can't, but does it grieve you, or do we accept? I will tell you what, when you, when you, you drive down the road and you see a church flying the rainbow flags, that, that the, the, the churches, the believers that have accepted, are encouraging, are affirming sinful lifestyle, and I don't want to just throw all, you know, that's, that's the only type of sin, but when you see believers who are embracing or encouraging sin, their hearts aren't grieved by it. I think we'd be wise to ask, is, is, are, are, those, are those believers? If we find ourselves giving in to sin, uh, accepting it, I think we might be wise in asking, am I really in the faith? So we see his heart was, was grieved. And finally, we see he, there's obedience to God's commands. A, a, a righteous person, a, a, a believer, is going to have some obedience to God's commands. It will be perfect. Well, I, I know my own obedience to God has not been perfect in my life, so I'm not, you know, we still struggle with our sin nature, but there's an obedience. Genesis 19.23 says the sun had, has, had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. And it's kind of, this is after the, the angels pull him and his daughters out, get them to flee. They, they, they obey. They don't obey well. Um, they almost have to be dragged out of the city, but they obey and they enter this city, this Zoar, before God destroys Sodom, before God destroys the other cities of the plain. 
So while Lot is far from successful in living as a God follower, we, we would not recognize him as a, a good example, a shining example. But we can see God's hand at work in Lot's life. You can see those moments. I think there's a challenge in our own lives. Do we carry any of those characteristics? Are they growing in our lives? So the next logical question as we, as we come to a close here, the next logical question is, is a believer living like this okay? Is it okay for us to live like this? Is Lot the example that it's okay for us to follow? We know there's those super Christians like Paul and Peter, but can we live like Lot? Just live in the world, just, just live and let live, but yet be saved, have our get out of hell free card. If you ever play Monopoly, you know, the get out of jail, get out of jail free card. We have my little, little get out of hell card, but I can live like the world. Is that okay? Paul tells the Corinthian Christians that they're carnal. You know, they're fleshly. They, they see the world through fleshly eyes, but he's clear these are believers. So, you know, can we trust in Christ but live like the world? I think that's a good question to ask. I think the answer is no. No, this is not okay. This is not an acceptable way to live. Why? Well, because sin damages the sinner. Sin damages the person committing the sin. It always brings pain. It always brings, brings hardship. And Lot is the prime example of this truth. And I think it's, as you read through the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers, and probably majority is... is uh, the books of Moses, so probably Moses particularly, there are things that Moses will write about, and he does not comment on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Think of uh, Jacob and his four wives and all the, all the, everything that goes on there. Moses doesn't write that, man, this was bad, but he, he shows you the turmoil that came about. The multiple wives, you, you see, now, now with Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, you do see the problems. But I don't think you even get a, now this was a bad idea. We just see the outgrowth of what happened. And I think this is what we see with, with Lot. He's a prime example of this truth. What are the consequences of not living righteously? So you're a believer. You're in the faith. You've trusted Christ. You're, you're confident that, that you're... Because of your faith in God, you have a home in heaven. But you're not going to live righteously. You're not going to live in a way that honors God. What could go wrong? Well, what did Lot lose? And the list I have is just what Lot lost. This is not an exhaustive list. Loss of home. The last thing we see him, he's living in a cave. Where's his, where's his herds? Where are his flocks? Where's all the comforts? Everything that, that he had gone. He lost his family. And again, we don't have time to go into all the details here, but I think there's a reason why Abram negotiated 10, because I think that's the size of Lot's family. Now, this is a speculation on my part. So, you, so we know Lot has a wife. We know he has two daughters that are living in the home, and we know he has sons-in-laws. So there's at least six of them. And if, if, there was a, if there was a third daughter or a fifth daughter, whatever the number was, and, and other sons-in-laws, his family may be ten. How many get out of Sodom? Four. But then Lot's wife, when, when, when the scriptures say that she turned back and was turned into a pillar of salt, the picture is not of she just glanced back, oh, what's happening over there? And God punished her because he's a mean-spirited she lingered. Fire and brimstone are literally fly, are, are, are literally falling. This is a bomb zone. You know, this is ground zero. And she stands back because she can't let go. That's home. And the you know, she's hit by the blast radius, most likely. She's probably covered in the the the, the salt and bitumen and, and all the things that are that are falling out of the sky. That's probably what that, that means. But she lingers, and she, she doesn't make it. So we see Lot and his two daughters are all that get out of there. So he loses his family. 
Lot might not have fallen into Sodom's weakness, but his wife and kids did. Loss of reputation or influence. He's mocked by his son-in-laws. He's mocked by the Sodomites. And honestly, as we read through the passage, unless Peter said righteous Lot, this man is left on the trash bin of history as a cautionary, even after Peter wrote about him, he's a cautionary tale. You don't say, hey, you know what you should be like? You should be like Lot. You should aspire to be like Lot. No, his, his story is there so we don't do this. Loss of peace and joy. Now, this isn't specifically stated. I think, I think as we leave him sitting in a cave raising his grandson's son, I think there's not a lot of peace and joy there. I think we can infer that. But look, nothing worked out for Lot since he left Abraham. When, when, when we see him part ways of Abraham, he's so wealthy that the, the land can't support them. His, everything's been going well. And everything falls apart after that. He had been at the center of where God was working. But once he walked away, once he left, his whole world fell apart. And this is where we leave Lot. He's righteous in believing God. It's a positional righteousness. Yet everything in his life, every other decision in his life blew up in his face. For the New Testament Christian, salvation is not dependent on our performance. Christ paid the price for our sin, but you cannot wallow in wickedness and think that all will work out for you. Some of us are only... Are, are, our only thought is, I got my home in heaven. You know, I got, my, I got my ticket to heaven. That's all I need. And we start thinking, what does God offer? What does the Christian life offer? Peace, joy, confidence, rest. Lot gave up all of that, making bad choices. Indulging in sin, doing what you know to be wrong. It'll wreck your life. It'll wreck your family. It'll wreck your reputation. It'll wreck your joy. It might kill you. Lot was righteous because God is merciful and faithful, but he wasted the years of his life. He wasted them on one bad decision after another, and in the process, he led his loved ones down a godless path. Peter doesn't say, Righteous Lot's wife. It doesn't say righteous Lot's daughters. They didn't have the same faith. He didn't lead them to God. He led them to Sodom. Don't follow that example. As we close, I'm going to ask Karen to come up and, and play, the, play the closing song. But I want to give you a chance to respond to God's word. If you're here you've, and you've trusted Christ for salvation... You're, you're, you're confident that you're in the faith and you can see yourself growing in your faith. I want you to take a moment to thank him. Thank God for drawing you to himself. Make no mistake, if you, if you humbled yourself for God, it's because he called you, he drew you. Ask for wisdom and strength to live righteously. Maybe you're here and you see your life mirrored in Lot's life. Maybe you've been living too close to wickedness and you know you need to make some changes. You're in the faith. You're a believer. But man, I've been nosing around sin. I've been getting involved in things I know I shouldn't. Well, first, ask God for forgiveness. Ask him to forgive. Second, ask him for strength to grow in your faith and move forward in godly living. And then seek out a mature brother or sister for help. We are not the... the, the Christian life is not a lone wolf life. This is not an individual sport. We're a team. There's a reason. Uh, uh, the body of Christ, the assembly, those are the terms that, that the scriptures use. Find a believer or two to help you. And then perhaps you're here and you, need, and you recognize you need to trust Christ for salvation. That, that unlike Lot, you're not even a believer. You haven't trusted Christ. Maybe you're living like Lot, without the faith in God. You need to trust 
in Christ for salvation. Maybe he's working in your heart. Maybe you know that. He's drawing you to himself. Well, you can trust him. Acknowledge your sin. Ask him to forgive and save. But I'll give you a moment now as the piano plays. Speak with God. Lord, again, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenges and the encouragements that are there. We thank you that even though Lot was, was far from perfect, far from, from what he should have been, you are faithful. You are perfect. You're, fa- you're, you're faithful in, in, in delivering your people. We pray that you would uh, continue to grow us and, 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 and deepen our faith. We pray for those who have... have who have trusted you but have, have fallen into sin, who are, are, are living like Lot. We pray that you would give them uh, the strength they need. Let them come to that repentance and, and trust in you. Let them surround themselves by godly men and women that would, would encourage and spur them on, would, would uh, uh, provoke them to righteousness. And we pray, Lord, for anyone who hasn't trusted you, who doesn't have uh, eternity in heaven, uh, in front of them. They, they, their path leads to eternal condemnation. I pray that they would turn to you, they would trust you. I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that they could know the, the freedom that, that, that forgiveness brings, know the, the joy of adoption into your family. We ask you to guide and direct, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.